Good evening, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Georgette Vigil. I'm the Senior Director for Alumni Engagement and Outreach at Colorado Law. During the presentation, you can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be monitored as they are submitted. Uh, you can vote on questions that interest you the most. Alexia Brune Marks will respond to questions following the presentation. As a reminder, everyone is on mute. It is my pleasure to introduce Dean Anaya, who has been the Dean of Colorado Law since 2016. His internationally recognized scholar and author in the areas of international human rights and issues concerning indigenous peoples. He served as the United Nations Special Repertoire on Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2018 to 2014. In addition to his teaching and scholarship, Dean Anaya has litigated major cases involving Indigenous peoples, human rights in domestic and international tribunals. Please join me in welcoming Dean Anaya. Thank you, Georgette, and hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's Colorado Law Talk the roles and rights of essential food system workers during COVID-19, featuring Colorado Law Professor Alexia Brune Marks. The Colorado Law Talk series was launched in 2017 to share the groundbreaking research, knowledge, and ideas of the Colorado Law faculty with the broader legal community in the Denver area. And especially now that we've gone virtual with the legal community throughout the state and beyond. The mission of Colorado law includes not just providing an exceptional legal education, but also engaging in research and producing influential scholarship with impact in the real world. And this scholarship, of course, advances our public service mission. Professor Brune Mark's work epitomizes our mission. Her expertise and research on food systems law and commitment to public service have led her to explore food system resiliency in the time of COVID. Along with the research, she serves on the Colorado Coronavirus Farm and Food Systems Task Force, working on Project Protect Farm System Workers. Professor Brune Marks is a graduate of Colgate University and Northwestern University Law School, and she has a PhD in Applied Economics from Purdue. She joined the faculty of Colorado Law in 2009. You can find out more about Professor Brune Mark's impressive background in the detailed biography that's been made available to you. I'm very happy to now turn the program over to Professor Alexia Brune Marks. Hello, good evening, and thank you so much, Dean and Naya, for those really kind words. I want to thank, first of all, Dean and Naya for inviting me, the Kahlo Law Review for publishing our policy agenda. And to you, distinguished alumni, colleagues, students, and friends for zooming into this talk. I'm grateful to my friend and colleague, Nicole Savita, CU Masters of the Environment lead for inviting me to serve on the task force I will be describing. And for recent class of 2020 CU law grad and now CU postdoc fellow, Hunter Knapp for tireless work on this project. And I thank my family for enduring six months of zooming. I want to also thank the Colorado Farm and Food Systems Rapid Response Team and the group I've been working with, Project Protect Food Systems, and the policy team especially for the opportunity to contribute my two cents to this incredible project. So my story is actually more of a noodle with kinks and less of a straight line. Born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, my family emigrated to the United States outside of New York City when I was eight years old. In 1991, college degree in hand, I started my career as an entrepreneur, working with and trading Pol with Poland. Five years later, I returned to school for nine years straight. I went for a master's and ended up with a master's and a PhD in agricultural economics from Purdue, and later a law degree from Northwestern. 9-11 was a turning point for me and made me switch dissertation topics to focus on allocating federal terrorism funds based on risk. And since I was in an ag school, on a model that included bioterrorism. Degrees in hand, I was pulled from Northwestern to work in DC to implement my dissertation. 
and later was hired by CU Law. I live in Boulder with my husband and my three awesome, they told me to say so, girls researching and teaching food systems at CU Law. I love my job. I've had the pleasure of teaching over a thousand CU Law students in torts alone, and I've enjoyed long lasting friendships like my co-author Hunter, who started in my torts class three years ago. And after two more classes, he thought he'd seen the last of me until I twisted his arm to jump into this project with me. So why do I mention this story? Because it is my multi-colored lens. A Latina, an immigrant, an economist, lawyer, and former National Lab employee who understands a business's bottom line. Uniquely, I've been through meat processing plants and farm fields and have worked on numerous projects, classified and unclassified, to protect our nation's infrastructure, including agriculture. So we each have our own stories of how the pandemic has affected us. And as I talk about COVID, a respiratory illness caused by a new virus called SARS-CoV-2, I'm sensitive that many of you have experienced loss, even tragedy, and this is quite personal to you. I plan to share what I see as the problem, contextualize it with stories, and share some solutions. All of this is driven by more, my work on the Colorado COVID systems rapid response team. I'll talk about each of these roadmap items that you see in front of you, bringing in the elephants in the room, which you see on the left. So I'll talk about the pandemic and multiple narratives, the disconnect between food and essential worker, what it's like to be on that front line, and also about initial remedies and long-term support. On March 11th, Governor Paulus issued an executive order declaring a disaster emergency due to the presence of COVID in Colorado. And in those early days of the pandemic, several urgent issues emerged. First, those who were already food insecure became even more insecure due to joblessness and other food disruptions. The pictures in front of you show empty grocery stores, like the one I took at King Supers, at my local King Supers on March 10th. And it shows kids lined up to receive their free and reduced fee lunches when school doors closed. In Boulder, the school district launched food distribution. No identification or paperwork was required and the bags included eight meals to just take home. With the pandemic impacting people from all socioeconomic backgrounds, the food distribution sites are now places where district families from all walks of life go to help stretch their monthly budget. Colorado was not immune. So according to a recent survey by Hunger Free Colorado, more than one in three Coloradans reported being food insecure during the pandemic, with 10% indicating that they have had to cut back on food almost every day. And even worse, 25% of parents reported they had to reduce the amount of food for their children. Since COVID-19 hit, food pantries have seen two or 10 times the, numer no, the normal demand with many families reaching out for help for the first time ever. Since the start of the pandemic, over 400,000 Coloradans filled, filed for unemployment, supplemental nutritional assistance program SNAP caseloads have risen 20% with 5% increases in most states. And the state's Medicaid program is, predicated, is predicted to swell by 500,000. And nearly one in three Coloradans are now concerned about their family's ongoing access to food. Now that's a lot of numbers, but you can imagine how much worse the situation was in other parts of the country. Well, you can't pick strawberries over Zoom, you can all, although you can do almost anything else, right? Those who produce our food were deemed essential by Colorado executive order and continued working due to economic necessity in conditions at times that compromised their health and some invariably got sick due to a lack of planning in the workforce and PPE due to complications with COVID and existing conditions. As meatpacking workers in Colorado got sick with COVID, plants witnessed high rates of absenteeism and either shut down or were shut down by public health officials. With plants operating at reduced capacity, big pig farmers had to euthanize animals, as many as 10,000 a day in Minnesota alone. There's less economic pressure regarding beef cattle, not that everybody wants to know about ag production, but ranchers can sometimes feed them on pasture at minimum additional, minimal additional costs. 
but poor production has less slack in the system. Feeding animals and finishing barns is really expensive. And if they get too big, slaughterhouses won't take them because they'll overwhelm processing equipment. So as economist Jason Lusk at Purdue puts this nicely, you start getting backlogs of piglets and nurseries, then in farrowing houses, and then finishing barns. But if you can't get market hogs out the door, something's got to give. So here we are, we're in March. And March was a crazy month for us all. I can just only imagine some of your stories. And sometimes, like many of you, I act first and then I think about it. In March, as I taught my CU law courses and, and um, they were international business transactions and food law and policy, and as I quarantined and homeschooled, I was asked to join two working groups. Like I had a lot of time, right? So I joined a National Science Foundation working group on nat national data collection on food insecurity. And I joined the Colorado Farm and Food Systems Rapid Response Team, launched by Live Well Colorado to address food system disruptions. A Denver-based organization, Frontline Farming, mobilized a sub-working group, Project Protect, to protect food system workers. And I was asked to join this group of immigrants, farmers, scholars, activists, unions, and workers across Colorado to identify, elevate, and address the needs of the essential people who contribute their labor to all parts of the food system. So who are these essential food system workers? Well, some of the most marginalized workers in the state of Colorado. And I'll talk about the first two um, yeah, quite a bit in this presentation. So farm workers are field workers, orchard workers, ranch ha hands, feedlot workers, regardless of their legal status and classification. And processing workers are meat and poultry, dairy, grain, and other food processing facilities. So I'll touch upon, but won't discuss at length, the other essential food system workers like warehouse and distribution workers, retail and foods service workers, and last mile workers. We've been meeting on Zoom since April, two times a week and lately sometimes three times a week, not including the reports and the data that's been collected. By the end of May, Nicole Hunter and I, we're the three lawyers in the room, co-authored our first draft of the document you see on your right, the Colorado, long title, Colorado Coronavirus Crisis Essential Food System Worker Policy Response Agenda. Now, since it was written before the Colorado legislative session ended, um, we had to revise it in July to include new Colorado guide guidance and legislation. So the latest version published last week in the Col Colorado Law Review online forum mention some of this new legislation. So here's the, here's, here's the problem, as I see it, is that at a time when food system workers are essential and heroic, they are among the most vulnerable and unprotected. And that is because there is a disconnect between the food that we eat and those who make our food, those who work in the shadows of society. The average American eats 200 pounds of meat per year. So look on the look on your left, and you see that you know sizzling plate of four slices of bacon. Now imagine eating 600 plates or one plate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day for seven months. That's 200 pounds of meat per year. So supply sources change during the pandemic and animals just did not stop growing. So while demand for food eaten away from the home was falling, demand for food purchased at grocery stores spiked, leading to some empty shelves um, seen earlier, the one I found on King Supers and grocery stores. Grocery stores can anticipate and plan for peaks in demand, such as days around Thanksgiving and Christmas, even regional disruptions and hurricanes, but not these types of global shocks. Meanwhile, unlike other manufacturing systems, plants and animals, animal growth can't be stopped with a flip of a switch, nor can food processing chains be quickly reoriented from wholesale to retail production. When grocery stores ran bare, production was not the problem. It kept going until it could no longer operate safely. Millions of farms, farm and food processing system workers produce the food that we eat. Many of these farm workers and processing workers, you see them on the right-hand side, are immigrants, 
migrants, resettled refugees, like Miss Deng from Sudan on the far right with her three children. She is a JBS plant worker who fell ill with COVID. She's from Sudan originally, moved as a refugee to Ethiopia and was later resettled here in the United States. So roughly 175,000 immigrants work in meat packing jobs. My point is the disconnect between the food that we eat and the way it is made allows for essential workers to live in the shadows of our food system and makes it convenient for those who continue to treat labor as an input to producing profit. Put differently, if hungry Americans found grocery stores bare, it would personalize the pandemic and show the pandemic as a real problem. Can each of you think back to those early days of the pandemic? You know, for many of us, it was March. <clears throat> and think about those empty shelves. Did you see, stop to think that that was caused by COVID sweeping across meatpacking plants and farm fields? And honestly, when I was looking for food for my family, I didn't think of it either. So the irony is, as concern for animal welfare has changed the way companies do business, ensuring that eggs are produced cage-free and all these certifications that we see in the grocery store, um, that chickens roam free range and that pregnant hogs are not confined in small gestational crates, there's still little outcry about conditions for workers who produce every, every meal we eat. So this slide actually just highlights that essential workers remain in the shadows because the numbers do not highlight them. If you look at Colorado as, you know, in a, as a state you, and you look at it as a brush stroke, Colorado is a very mild yellow state when it comes to COVID. But when you kind of look down at granular kind of county level data like this, you start to see that Weld County which is that blue line on your far left, and home to the largest meat processing facility in Colorado, JBS. With half of the population of Denver, with Weld County, with half of the population of Denver County or Adams County or Arapahoe counties, um, had the number of COVID cases and deaths on par with these counties. So little Weld County with half of the population was spiking way beyond those other three counties that were double in size. I think that has an impact, at least it does on me. So nationally, as of August 14th, at least 55,000 workers in meatpacking, food processing and farm workers have tested positive for COVID-19 and, and at the least 237 workers have died. And that's not just in the US, by the way, COVID-19 clusters have appeared in meatpacking plants in Germany, Canada, Brazil, Australia, all over the world. But in the United States, you can see that they mostly kind of congregate in the Midwest. As you see, look at the map, the arrow is pointing to a cluster, a couple, a couple clusters in Colorado. But you can see where meatpacking is. It's in the Midwest, it's in Iowa, it's in South Dakota. And the map just shows that. So let's do a deeper dive into Colorado numbers. So bubbles on the map that you see right on the top in front of you show geographical concentration in Northeast Colorado. So the bubbles are outbreaks and cases and deaths related to farm uh, food processing, which is orange and meat packing, which is in red. So the table reports the outbreaks and the cases and the deaths for farms and food, system, food processing and meat packing. Food processing has roughly the same number of cases in the 500s, you see that 536 and 506, but meat packing has had roughly double the death toll. By the way, maybe in case you're interested, the largest farm outbreaks have been in mushroom farms and potato fields. So the farm outbreaks are the blue dots in the bottom left, and that's mushroom potato fields. Food processing um, has had 110 cases, and so those those big orange dots are mostly the largest dots are Leprino Foods uh, in, in Greeley and also Fort Morgan, which is a cheese, cheese manufacturing, cheese processing. And meat packing outbreaks, which are the big red dots, uh, you can see those, JBS, which is Greeley, the largest red dot, uh, 316 cases, six deaths, and Cargill on the far, on the, just to the right of that, which is in Fort Morgan with 108 cases and eight deaths. So stepping back for a minute, I'm gonna step back. Um, 
was anyone looking into this? So is anyone running these numbers? National labs actually warned as the nation's pandemic planning proceeded, DHS assigned researchers at Sandia and at Los Alamos to model what could happen during the outbreak. Simulations found that a peak absentee rate of 28% and noted that if the rate remained above 10% for several weeks, it could cut food production in half. Approximately 40% of firms would cease to operate due to insufficient levels of labor. And that prediction was really accurate. From North Carolina to Kansas to Nebraska to Colorado, meatpacking plants experienced up to 50% absenteeism on processing lines, which led cattle slaughter to fall by 40% and pork production by over 50% at the end of April. So once these plants were infected, well, they shut down. And you, you heard about this in the news, right? So we have um, JBS on your right in Greeley in Colorado, one of the largest beef packers in the whole country, next to Tyson, Cargill, and National Beef, a subsidiary of the largest meat processing plant in the world, based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, has over 240 employees worldwide, worldwide and over 300 production units in more than 150 countries. I know that's a lot of numbers, but this is the largest meat packing plant, uh, meat packing company. The JBS plant in Greeley, Colorado first reported an outbreak on April 3rd, and since then we know 316 uh, meat packing employees have been infected with six deaths. Sioux Falls, South Dakota, let's just turn to that, it's on the left, is home to Smithfield Foods, which is one of the largest pork processing facilities in the United States. It's actually owned by the Chinese and it reported 929 COVID cases and two deaths and was the first of all the plants to close. It's also the oldest pork processing plant still in operation and supplies 130 million servings of food per week. You could tell I really like numbers or about 18 million servings per day and employs 3,700 people. More than 550 independent family farmers supply to the plant. These are just family farms that supply to these very big plants in exactly the, the combination that I spoke of earlier. We have nurseries, we have far, farrowing, farrowing to finish to the slaughter to the production. So these are 500 independent family farms that supply to the plant. So you can start to see how much is at stake here when a plant shuts down in economic, in political, in, you know, these are people's livelihoods. This is everything that they've saved for. So the meat industry, Tyson, ran a full page ad in the New York Times that they needed federal action to feed Americans. This is as we see those absenteeism rates, as we see them closing down. Soon after Trump's 28, April 28th executive order, which classified meat producers as critical infrastructure and pressured the state and local health agencies to back away from their recommendation to temporarily close them to get the disease under control. Some plants offered financial incentives to keep them on the job. So another Smithfield plant in Crete, Nebraska, which at one time had more than 600 em infected employees, offered $500 responsibility bonus to workers if they showed up for all their shifts and gave them the, name, the same beard nets in lieu of protective face masks. A Tyson plant in Camilla, Georgia offered 2,100 workers a $500 bonus if they worked in April, May, and June without missing a day. So I'm gonna do another kind of step back now. I, I, I kind of step back when, I, when I'm doing this and I think about the topics that I teach, the topics that I research, and I, I do international trade, international business transactions. So why did these plants stay open? And I'm gonna give you this, this is the, ele the trade elephant in the room, right? I teach the, these subjects and we export billions in pork and chicken and beef per year. The disruptions at America's meat plants in April and May had ripple effects in June pork exports based on USDA data. Total shipments for one month dropped to a nine month low as cargoes to China declined to the lowest rate since October. Trade and trade agreements have a lot at stake. The trade deficit could throw off China's ability to meet its trade deal pledge of buying billions more in agricultural products this year. You heard about the, the tariff war, right? We've been in a tariff war with the Chinese for over a year. 
So since pork meat was likely to be a key part of the transaction because American swine fever that has been decimating pigs in Asia. Adding more fuel to the fire, pressure to control the pandemic was felt in June when China restricted poultry imports from a Tyson plant in Arkansas because the plant had a large outbreak. Look, we've heard that COVID cannot be transmitted to raw meat. However, from someone who studies and researches food safety, outbreaks are related to hygiene and poor hygiene, if left unchecked, can lead to pathogens like the ones we've heard of, E. coli and hepatitis A. Let's examine the workers, the conditions of their and their vulnerabilities. This poster commemorates the loss of JBS meatpacking workers in Greeley, Colorado on your left. And on your right, a statement made about essential workers, essential, not disposable. Inside the plant, we know that packing workers face high risks of, of contraction and spreading of COVID, but why? First, because of the nature of the facilities themselves. I had a chance to go inside a meat packing plant as an ag student, but plants don't normally open up their doors. But these workplaces are packed. Smithfield has been direct about why it's not been able to establish social distancing throughout its facilities. And the quote on the right-hand side is from the chief executive officer. For better or for worse, the plants are what they are. Four walls, engineered design, efficient use of space, et cetera. Spread it out? Well, okay, why and where? To say it is a challenge is an understatement. These are by and large older plants, not conducive for engineering for COVID. Next, meat pat processing. Aside from these old facilities, meat processing is an exhausting, dangerous and labor intensive job. Can you imagine, just for a second, one processing plant in Iowa, in Iowa will process 19,500 pigs per day. Workers slaughter and process hundreds of animals an hour. They're forced to work in high speeds, cold conditions, doing thousands of the same rep repetitive tasks over and over and over with few breaks, and they stand shoulder to shoulder. A thousand people might work a single eight hour shift and often workers get only a second or two to complete their task. They're working in such rapid pace that it's difficult to breathe and keep the mass positioned properly on their faces. Jose on the left is a plant worker from JBS who mentioned that the plant pays lip service to social distancing on temperature checks and in break rooms. But when you're on the line, you're shoulder to shoulder. The people, here's some more stories of people. Preventing spread goes beyond addressing safety at the plant and needs to address social and economic factors that play a role. Meat processing and farm workers are vulnerable, vulnerable people. First, compared with workers in many other industries, food workers, they earn low wages. They work in more physically demanding, dangerous jobs. Farm employees and workers alike acknowledge that even the most basic interventions to stop COVID's transmission, like social distancing and mask covering, often aren't feasible, especially in hot temperatures. Next, the work workforce is largely immigrants and resettled refugees. People of color make up 87% of meat processing plant COVID cases. Meat packing has the fifth largest concentration of refugee workers. And by 2011, it was roughly 56%. They speak 26 different languages. And for them, seeking a doctor's care can feel really, 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 really risky. They're often reluctant to speak out about unsafe conditions for fear that they'll be fired or at worst deported. Next, um, we talk about housing. So on the slide, I talk about housing quite a bit. Out of necessity, many processing and farm workers, they live in multi-generational homes or other crowded housing environments living in close quarters, sleeping in bunk beds, and sharing bathrooms and kitchens. They ride crowded buses to fields and often work in groups. They may also ride company operated buses for an hour or more each day to and from the plants and the farm fields, which are located in rural areas, which again puts them at prolonged close contact with other people. Like the picture you see on your left. They also have lower rates of health care coverage, no health insurance or paid sick leave and experience higher rates of food insecurity and chronic health issues. So I mentioned all of these things, but honestly, the, the 
I have one example that really kind of says it all. At an early meeting with Project Protect, imagine the Zoom meeting with all these you know, pictures in front of you. I heard a story which I will call under one roof. Rosa is originally from Mexico. She works in Greeley with eight others in her home. It's an extended household and everyone minus the children is involved in the food industry. From meat packing to dairy work, to cheese manufacturing, to farm work, and even laundering uniforms for the meat packing plant right down the street. Rosa told her story about how her mother contracted COVID from the dirty uniforms that she laundered for the local meat packing plant. The consequences of work environment where ill workers expose others on the job to the virus will carry over into other people's homes, into places of worship and their communities at large. So this is the problem. The disconnect leads to a class of people, a class of individuals, vulnerable people working in conditions that are suboptimal. It seems like what economists would say, this is a market failure, we have to correct this. But can the market correct itself? Will companies take appropriate steps to protect workers on their own? From my food safety research, I've learned that corporate change is driven by a combination of market forces, falling stock price, shareholder, and other lawsuits and settlements. In the food industry, settlements are very common and sometimes lead industries to regulate themselves, like, for instance, the leafy green industry after the spinach foodborne illness lawsuits. They regulate themselves for fear of more severe federal regulation. Sometimes they negotiate with federal regulators and they co-regulate. So I have to ask myself at this point, what are the COVID related lawsuits revealing, if anything? What are they saying to us here? So it's no, it's no coincidence, uh, before I get into what's on the slide, before it's no coincidence that a few days after the lawsuits against Smithfield, Tyson put a full page ad in the New York Times saying that the food industry is broken. And a few days later, Trump administration made the executive order to encourage plants to remain open. There's really just one case that sums it up. The one on the bottom left of your slide, the made right worker safety case. Most people know Scranton for Dunder Mifflin from the hit show, The Office. But today it's got a different claim to fame. Three workers in a meat packing plant sue the Department of Labor to get a federal court to force OSHA to immediately inspect the company's Scranton plant for COVID-19 hazards and require, compel the, com the company um, to comply with federal safety standards. They allege that OSHA arbitrarily and capriciously failed to protect food workers from imminent danger at the plant. This is one example of a case many are watching but there are many cases in the COVID docket. Early in the pandemic, some of the first lawsuits were brought by workers at McDonald's of all places, claiming that they were not being offered PPE. Those were in March. April suits uh, also started against Smithfield, right, where workers wage suits against Smithfield, for example, to make the plant take protective measures. Smithfield incidentally won and a judge deferred to OSHA to determine what OSHA thought was best. So preemption is, is, is running through all of these cases. But in Smithfield, like the McDonald's case, plaintiffs were not seeking, and this is important, they were not seeking monetary relief, but injunctive relief. They just wanted to force Smithfield or McDonald's to change its practices. Even the, even the, plant, in, the plant workers in Scranton, they just wanted OSHA to come in and compel the plant to protect them to follow the CDC guidelines, to provide appropriate PPE, and to change the work process so to prevent the virus's spread. Other cases I might mention are, are cases about, on your left-hand side, there's a case against Tyson, a case against JBS, and the case against the Trump administration. The one in green is actually the one that won. So in this case, um, New York Attorney General was suing the Trump administration. The Department of Labor, well, the, ag the attorney general claimed that the Department of Labor, um, the sick leave rules from the second coronavirus bill, the one issued in March, impermissibly narrowed 
which workers could access their right to paid leave and imposed additional barriers in accessing that leave. That case was actually about health workers and the New York Attorney General sued and won. And now we have the, the rules that have changed. Other cases are like the Tyson's food plant where the families of three deceased workers at Tyson's in Iowa are suing Tyson execs for, for false misrepresentations and gross negligence. They failed saying that the company failed to provide workers with appropriate PPE, again, failed to implement sufficient socially distancing, again, and measures to protect workers from an outbreak that actually resulted in three deaths. So there are many, 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 many cases, and I, I'm not gonna go through them all, but I'm tracking them in case you're interested, please do contact me. So these are the cases. Guidance and legislation have been important first steps. On the federal level, lawmakers passed four pieces of legislation to address the pandemic, but there were gaps in all of them. I just mentioned one gap. The attorney general sued the Trump administration for one gap. There were gaps for food system workers. Our initial Project Protect Food Systems Policy Response Agenda released in May 22nd, made recommendations, many of which were met in June with the Colorado legislature and agencies under the direction of Governor Paulus that they, and the rules that they enacted. Like for example, these two boxes in front of you. The first one, the guidance for the agricultural industry. So on your left, the guidance for the agricultural industry released by the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, CDPHE, which required employers to provide PPE to employees to increase social distancing, um, additional housing and dining facilities to isolate those exposed to COVID and to communicate vital information to employees. And then on the right, we see the state legislature also passed important laws. These were laws that we were asking for in our first agenda on May 22nd related to paid sick leave. So it extended paid sick leave rights for all employees in Colorado and prohibited employees, this is important, and prohibited employers from discriminating, retaliating, or taking adverse action against any whistleblower employees who raised concerns about workplace health and safety or who voluntarily wore PPE in the workplace. Farm workers, oh, now that some of the immediate relief has been granted, our policy agenda recommends long-term solutions grounded in a coordinated effort towards a farm worker bill of rights or an essential worker bill of rights, a concept that labor groups and advocates have supported to ensure that workers have full rights and protections and benefits they need and deserve, including enforceable health and safety protections. Governor Paulus recently ordered more than $288 million from the Disaster Emergency Fund to be encumbered to be used to, to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. These funds are to be used for expenses incurred by the agencies while implementing COVID-19 related policies from March 1 all the way through December 2020. And after the original designations to the different agencies, there's still 88 million that's left over. Now, some portion of these funds already allocated to the agencies like CDPHE, for example, and the remaining amount, the 88 million, can be allocated to essential food system worker programs. Now, this more essential food workers, farm workers bill of rights, this more holistic approach and agenda sets forth recommendations to protect two, um, two groups, or we wanted to one, protect, and you see this on the slide, protect workers and families in the workplace in three different kind of buckets, I'll put them, through more enforcement, better Colorado standards, and more education. And secondly, to protect workers and families outside of the workplace. So our new agenda, not the May 22nd one, but the one that's been published in the Colorado Law Review, actually mentions these two, protecting them in the workplace and protecting them outside of the workplace. Now I'll touch upon the, the second one first, outside of the workplace. What does that mean? What are we really talking about? Well, outside the workplace, we discuss things like empowering community healthcare and networks. We talk about supporting children of food system workers. We're looking at 
how these food system workers take, can take care of their kids at the same time that they're working. What about childcare? What about the kids? Do they need computers? Do they need internet access? So there is a, quite a bit of work to be done on that part of the project. Now looking at the first part, protecting workers and families in the workplace. I'll turn to that first. So here we examine enforcement in plants, farms, and ag labor housing. Enforcement of federal guidance varies by employer. CDC guidance, which you see right there on the left, is currently, well, they must provide PPE, but guidance is currently optional when it comes to distancing. And it actually says in that teeny little font, I blew it up to say, to show you, it says if feasible. So you see quite a bit of the guidance actually mentions if feasible, if possible. So you can see here pre-guidance, so are some pictures of the meatpacking plants and these pictures are, are pretty difficult to find, but you, they're out there. And they, they, they're from having been in one of these, it's exactly like this. They, people are standing, workers are standing shoulder to shoulder. Um, it's very tight. They're working at very fast speeds. And I have to say, uh, USDA regulations are increasing line speeds on many of these production lines. That's something else to talk about for another moment, but uh, it's very quick work. On the bottom, you see there, after the guidance, the CDC guidance, there were some changes in the way meatpacking plants were set up. This one picture shows that there were some barriers placed in between workers, but yet if on the bottom of all the way on the left, you see that barriers, um, if feasible, should be between workers as they're six feet distancing and also in front of the workers as they're distancing kind of in face of another worker. And you don't really see that here. Also on your far right, you look at some transportation issues, right? Like you have, We've seen buses, even the RTD buses, or you have to socially distance, and you have some spaces where you can sit. But on the far right, you see a picture of workers commuting to work, and that they're not using those um, specially designated spots. So we spoke uh, through Project Protect with Raul, a union rep who's mentioned that meatpacking plants honor social distancing at temperature checks and breaks. I mentioned that but not on the floor or on the line as workers work tightly together. This is because of this slide. This is because guidelines by the Colorado Department of Health and the Environment, which in other states, they just follow the CDC guidelines, provide that distancing should occur where possible. It's not mandatory, just where possible. Now, you can't rely, you also can't rely. So you're not looking at your employer. You can't rely on OSHA inspections. I should mention that the National Employment Law Project recently reported that OSHA is operating with the lowest number of inspections in 45 years, only 862 at the beginning of the year, compared to 950 and 1400 in previous years. OSHA has received thousands of complaints since March, since COVID, and closed only half of them. They're way behind, under, um, under resourced, and don't have the time to do all these inspections. So, our policy agenda recommends making the CDPHE guidance mandatory and regarding basic health and safety protections to mitigate threats of injury and to protect workers against the virus that causes COVID, as well as guidance regarding distancing and empowering employer-provided housing. For farm workers and H-2A workers especially, we also mandate 100 square feet per person in sleeping quarters and 120 feet per person in areas used for combined cooking and eating and sleeping purposes. You should see these regs. If you just sat down and looked at these regs and looked at the what counts as 100 square feet, what spaces do, what spaces don't, what, what is 120 square feet? And it's, it, it's really very confusing, but also very mind opening. So, what we're also recommending is that we ensure employer provided housing meets the requirements of the COVID-19 pandemic and that these employer provided housing be re-inspected, that they be inspected and also then re-inspected just to ensure compliance with the CDPHE. We're also looking at, in addition to uh, my previous slide, which talked about enforcement, we're looking at better standards, higher standards, 
right? So many, many factors, including systemic racism, resulted in the exclusion of many food system workers from critical labor protections. Like for example, the Colorado overtime and minimum wage standards found in comps order number 36. Now comps order is going to be rewritten and revised in September and in the fall. And so we'll see a comps order number 37. But the, as it currently stands, it excludes farm workers from the right to collectively bargain, from the right to minimum wage, from the right to meal and rest periods, among other things. So better standards means revisiting these Colorado, the, these comps rules. Other recommendations that we're proposing are to provide temporary shelter for workers with COVID sy sym symptoms. Um, hazard pay for farm workers and to ensure food system workers can participate fully in forums designed to monitor working conditions in Colorado and to recommend policies to protect workers. The last part. So language justice is something that is just really new to me, uh, but it's very closely aligned with this request that we're making for more education. Over 26 languages are spoken in meat processing plants. And you see on the right, the CDC has over 20 languages that they provide some guidance in. But many health departments don't have translators or staff who can speak Spanish or indigenous Central American languages. Did you know that in Colorado, the JBS plant has many Eritrean and Ethiopians, for example? So nor has there been a systemic nationwide tracking of farm worker outbreaks thus far and has been done with long, as has been done with long-term um, care facilities. So education and data tracking are really, really important as we get further into um, the COVID long-term. So our, our policy agenda recommends, and these are the bullet points on the left and they're, they're in no particular order but I will talk about the first one. So creating worker poster, creating a worker friendly poster regarding COVID protections in several languages and enforcement numbers and enforcement phone numbers to call. You think that's an easy thing, but that is so important that the workers know who they can contact and that they recognize a poster with their language on it or just some symbols on it that they can relate to. Even Spanish speaking, if someone says they're Spanish speaking, it doesn't really mean that they're literate and that they can read and write in that native language. So that's actually really something that's really important needs to be considered. Um, employers too need more clarity as employers are confused about whether protections are required for posting and they want more clarity as well with, with posters and information. Another request is to provide training to employers and workers regarding COVID-19 and other health and safety issues. And then we have, um, thirdly, to support a promotora network, a group of skilled and respected Latinx community members who work within their community to bring resources and advocacy and needed services um, supported by the governor Paulus and the Colorado legislature through 2021 and beyond. Now, this might be new to you. So promotoras are health education models. They're lay health educators that train families and communities. So what we're proposing is to use this type of network, which is used in many other states just to promote health advocacy, to promote COVID um, literacy, essentially. So turning to one last, and finally, finally, one more. And finally, the state should establish a border commission, the last final dot, constituted by workers and advocates to report on the working conditions and welfare of farm workers in Colorado and to gather and analyze data and other information about wages and working conditions. We, we hardly hear, it's very difficult to find these, these stories that, that are being told in these communities. With an annual opportunity to convene and meet with the appropriate leaders at the CDLE, CDPHE, the CDA and the governor's office. So we've reached the end of the show, so to speak. And there's been a lot of information, a lot, a lot of information. And I would hope that if you want to support this local effort, that you'd reach out to me so that we can continue this conversation. Thank you for your time.
Alexia, thank you so much. We have a, a couple of questions. I must say, I feel more informed. You've magnified the importance of uh, essential food system workers and how it impacts all of us. Uh, our first question this evening is from Mark Hansen. Uh, he has written, I've gotten lots of questions about the rights and remedies for workers who become infected with COVID on the job. There seems to be some confusion about whether this, whether this is covered under work, workers' comp. Tort law presents tough proof issues about where and how a plaintiff became infected. Help. Help, 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 help me. So yes. Um, and I think that's really interesting. That's a very good point. So we have uh, we have workman's comp, right? And so you think you think, well, why wouldn't you know workman's comp just preempt all of these lawsuits? And what does workman's comp have to do with this? The the problem is that that um, oh screen share, sorry. Do you want me to? I think they took care of it. Okay, great. It looks like you did. Uh, so workman's comp. It varies in different states, right? So it's it's not a it, what, what may be coverable or maybe covered in one state may not be covered in another state. So generally, yes, it should be it should be amenable with workman's comp. It should be, but at the same time, when the worker leaves, there's a discussion about whether the worker will have the job upon the return and how long the worker will actually be away as well, because many of these rules stipulate like two weeks or two weeks return to work. Um, so the, the long answer, to, the short answer is that it varies by state. And in, yes, it should be covered under workman's comp to the best of my knowledge. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that answer. We, we still have a, a couple more questions here. Um, do you think the number of positive tests you note under are underreported? reported given the testing limitations that have existed or were the plants and agriculture locales with outbreaks able to do pretty comprehensive testing? No, no. So sadly, um, I think the numbers are wildly underreported. Um, I do not have um, the information from many of the farms themselves. And this is something that Project Protect, we're trying to do. So we're trying to collect more information from the farmers themselves and the outbreaks on the fields. We have surveys that have gone out to farm workers um, through advocacy organizations all over the state, trying to get in touch with, well, what are some of your clients facing? What are some of your clients telling you? Have they been tested? Are there tests? Is there PPE? So I think that the answer to that is no, there, it's, it's very, very underreported, I'm afraid. Um, and then I also do not think they have access to tests. They barely have access to PPE. PPE is, is you know, we've been talking about that since March, um, how workplaces should have PPE. Well, that continue, you'd think we would have had that solved by now, but workplaces and especially farms are still really wrestling with PPE where you hear farmers have to pay three to five dollars for a mask that they use for you know weeks on end. So um, the if we're even thinking about testing, that's kind of one step ahead of, it, that goes in the hands with the PPE and it's still very much in the infancy, infancy, I want to say. I also want to say that there's quite a bit of data online that reports farm uh, farm worker outbreaks, meat packing, farm worker, farm processing, and even in in the in the states that I've that I know have outbreaks, you do not see the state covered with all of those blue little bubbles that you would if you had outbreaks. I mean, and I'm and it just it's mind boggling because I know how much ag is in the state. I know I've heard and reported some reports of some outbreaks, but. It's very, there's a very little underreported, there's a lot of underreporting. Farmers are, farm workers are very nervous. These are migrant, seasonal, H2A workers. They're extremely vulnerable. They don't want to speak up and, and also the, employ, the employers don't want to speak up as well, I would assume. Um, so it's very underreported. So I think the numbers we're seeing 
on the, on the flip side in the meat packing plants, because of the lawsuits, we've seen discovery. So because of the lawsuits and because OSHA does test those plants, we do have numbers on those and public health officials have higher numbers and more credible numbers from the processing plants from the JBS, Laprino Foods um, in Colorado. But farm work is, is, is not very large, large, large mega farms. You know, food processing is consolidated, condensed. Farms are just here and there, they're scattered, they're not coordinated. And I think the Promotora network that we're advocating for will, will try to thread all of these different communities so that we have a better sense of what are their problems? What are their workers' rights issues? You know, what, what's happening with wages? What's happening with illnesses? Um, it's very difficult right now to get our, our, our data collected on the ground unless it's through these advocacy organizations. Thank you. And that question came from Erica Tarpe. The next Great. question is from Ruth uh, Pelton Roby. What remedies exist for JBS workers who were forced to return to work and then got sick? Didn't didn't Trump say they couldn't sue their employee their employees? Right. So I have seen, even though we have we have seen some, the lawsuits are a really interesting batch of cases. So we have employees that have been suing generally in some, in the states where workman's comp just preempts entirely um, the, per, the personal injury claim. There's some states that have allowed some claims to go forward because of the workman's comp rules in those states. And, and those states have proceeded um, against some of the meat packing plants in different states. And those, Remedies are injunctive primarily. So workman's comp would, would bar most personal injury claims, but injunctive claims have been you know, pursued against almost all of the meat plants um, as of late. We also see a bunch of different claims. So not so many, not as many um, wrongful death claims, but more injunctive relief, get the, pro get the plants protecting the worker claims. And, and of all of the cases that I've been watching, there's not, not a single personal injury wrongful death claim that has been won by a plaintiff. So these cases, I, another topic is to talk about the backlog in cases right now because of going, um, going virtual and doing online cases and online discover, online everything has led to some quite a number of backlog um, issues with cases moving forward. But plaintiffs are not winning. They haven't won a single case. The only case that's been won has been the case pursued by the attorney general against the Trump administration for um, the second Corona bill that had exclusions for health workers uh, as essential workers. So plaintiffs are really not winning. These cases are not moving forward. They're, get, they're being struck down. Um, many of the cases are actually saying that, that OSHA just preempts and they're throwing, the judge will just throw it to OSHA. So. I, I'm watching that really closely, but nothing, uh, plaintiffs are not winning, but they're also not filing as many of these personal injury, wrongful death type claims. They're following injunctive relief. They really just wanna do their jobs. Um, they need that income. Um, and for many of them, it's what they love. Well, there's a, a couple more questions, which I will email to you. Uh, oh, please do, yeah. To get answers for, and we'll send that out uh, to everyone later in the week. I'll turn it over to Jim. Great. Uh, thank you, Alexia, for uh, a really informative presentation and, and thought-provoking um, uh, beginnings of a discussion, I should say. Uh, you've yeah. certainly given us uh, an important perspective on, on where our, our food comes from and, and a lot to think about and digest on the extreme inequities experienced by, yeah. by food workers. And thank you all for, for joining us and for engaging in a, an important conversation. But by the end of the week, you will uh, receive a link to a recording of the presentation and a survey to share your thoughts with us. Uh, and uh, Colorado attorneys will receive a, a link for the CLE affidavit. Uh, and I wanna add a word of thanks to our terrific staff for making this presentation possible. Uh, thanks to 
Christina Delgado, uh, Teresa Coberly, and of course, uh, Georgette uh, Vigil. Before we close, I'd, I'd like to announce that as part of our anti-racism and representation initiative, Colorado Law will host a lecture series focused on the relationship between race and the law uh, with the objective of uh, generating thinking about the barriers to and, and possibilities of the law serving as a, a vehicle for uh, racial justice. Uh, this virtu virtual series, uh, which will feature several of our faculty members, will launch on September 30 um, with a lecture that I'll be delivering entitled Race and in Race in the Law, uh, Equality Still Dampened. Uh, stay tuned for further information on this. Again, thank you for joining. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening. Uh, be well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>